Hey everybody, Dave Lindbergh in Hong Kong with another episode of the THD podcast. Uh, this is a part two episode and we have Steve Temme from Listen uh, continuing on and he's going to be uh, talking about uh, perceptual algorithms uh, for end of line testing and specifically uh, something to uh, an enhanced measurement to detect loose particles in your speaker measurement. So we're going to get rolling on that in a moment, but without delay, Alti Association, our sponsor, we encourage everybody to go check out their website and see what they have to offer. It's great networking for people in the audio manufacturing industry. So without delay, let's uh, get into the discussion. So the one other thing I just wanted to talk about, um, speaking of perceptual measurements, is, you know, periodic distortion, harmonic distortion is not the only kind of distortion out there. There is something that we like to call loose particle distortion. But so in the early days, um, you know, we were catching rub and buzz, but there were cases where, you know, dirt, magnetic chips, um, foreign particles, whatever you want to call them, would fall into the voice coil gap. My favorite what expression was crap in the gap. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to be able to catch that because it's also annoying. We actually had one customer who was pretty funny who made pro audio loudspeakers and someone left a hammer inside the, the loudspeaker enclosure. <laughs> and the customer said, I keep on hearing this rattling sound. <laughs> and when they, when they got the speaker back, they found, you know, that the ultimate loose particle was this hammer jumping around when the cabinet vibrated. But in any case, we wanted to be able to catch, um, you know, even just uh, the lead wires to the um, uh, voice coil sometimes would hit the speaker. So how could we catch those? Mm -hmm. So I realized later on that it wasn't just loose particles that people wanted to catch. They also wanted to catch, um, rattling buttons and um, fasteners and, you know, the, the speaker in the test box. So if we want to catch these, what I'll call transient distortion, or some people call impulsive distortion, there's all kinds of names. Um, they're not periodic. They do get vibrated by the physical movement of the loudspeaker of the diaphragm. So, you know, it's, it's vibrating everything around it. And if something is loose, like a um, magnetic chip or glue chip in the voice call, or it's rattling a button on a smart speaker, and we try to analyze it in the frequency domain, it just looks like noise because it's not periodic. So the more we average, the more it averages out. So we can't really easily look at these defects in the frequency domain. It makes a lot more sense to look at them in the time domain. So at the back in 2004, when we were developing this algorithm, the only other, um, I'll call it analysis technique that we were aware of was Crest Factor. And Crest Factor is, uh, of course, a very useful um, analysis tool. And it's pretty simple to implement just by using what we call a track and high pass filter. So again, we do a fast sign sweep. We offset, quote, a high pass filter to um, remove the, uh, the stimulus and measure everything else. Everything else in this case is can be loose particles, but it can also be rub and buzz. And that's because not only will loose particles, by the way, Crest Factor just briefly to remind people, is the peak to RMS ratio. So if you look at a sine wave, the crest factor is like is 1.414. It's very low. But if you look at a transient, it's going to be very high. If you look at Robin Buzz, which kind of looks like a transient, it's also going to be high, typically um, over 10. So what people would do is they'd use um, this tracking high pass filter and look at the crest factor versus frequency. And it was a single distortion metric, but it didn't isolate periodic from what I'll call non-periodic distortion or um, transients. So it kind of lumped them together. The other problem is background noise also tends to have a high crest factor. I mean, random noise 
is is typically um, 20 dB. So um, we're also going to get false rejects due to factory background noise. Um, so that's no good. And of course, the limits are tricky too because they change versus frequency. There's none of this normalization being applied to the, uh, the loudness. So what we did back in 2004 is we said, well, let's do it a little differently. We're still gonna use our tracking high pass filter and capture whatever you wanna call the, the crud, the distortion and the noise. But instead of plotting it versus frequency, we're gonna plot it versus time and take the time envelope. Now, the reason we take the time envelope is we need to look at it, not like an oscilloscope, but we wanna look at it as, for example, dBSPL so that we can set limits. And instead of um, looking at crest factor, we're gonna count the number of transients uh, during that two second sweep. And basically, if we have um, loose particles or something rattling, we're gonna get many transient events. And if it's background noise, we're only gonna get maybe a few. I mean, if a compressor goes off or someone drops something, a forklift goes by in a production line, it's not gonna happen 50 times in two seconds where a loose particle or a button rattling, it's, it's gonna be at least 10 uh, events in a couple of seconds. So we can separate out what we'll call the um, transient defects or distortion coming from the product versus the background noise. And we can just set a simple limit where we say, if it's greater than three transient events, it's probably coming from the, the loudspeaker. But our algorithm back then was still, if you look at the envelope, it's still a bit tricky to set limits because again, they, they do change versus frequency. So we wanted to come up with a a uh, more robust way of doing it. So basically, um, the first thing is we want to separate out the, the loose particle waveform, as we call it, from the stimulus. And basically, we created a very good tracking notch filter so that you could listen to everything but the stimulus. Um, one of the things that always amazes me is that um, We've heard of the psychoacoustic phenomenon, the missing fundamental. Mm -hmm. And even though you, even though you notch out the uh, the stimulus, if you have some second and third harmonic or some distortion, you still hear some sign sweeping because your human ear is trying to fill it in and say, "Hey, that should be a sign sweep." But anyhow, I, I digress. It it kind of caught me off guard when I first did this, and I listened to the loose particle waveform without the stimulus. I thought I could still hear some of the stimulus. And like the filter uh, is working. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, signal processing. People put in uh, ampli you know, bass amplifiers and uh, rock and roll. Um, but we wanted a uh, easier way to set the limits because that was really the biggest challenge. People weren't using the loose particle algorithm because it still was getting kind of tricky to set. You know, they wanted to set a flat line again, and they couldn't. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to improve the uh, signal to noise, the dynamic range. And we also wanted to catch um, not just loose particles and, as I mentioned, buttons, but things in automotive, which they typically call buzz, squeak, and rattle. And that is, you know, door panels vibrating. And, um, you know, a car has so many fasteners, so many parts. And the last thing you want is your... Uh, you know, your $100,000 EV uh, Tesla making some annoying uh, rattling sounds because your speakers are vibrating it. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, um, the algorithm looked like this. We, we enhanced uh, the ability to extract artifacts, which basically we made a better notch filter. We still use envelope analysis. But the big difference is that we tried to come up with a better way to catch the peaks, the transients, using something called prominence. And I'll explain that in a moment. But other than that, it's the same algorithm from 2004. Hmm. So again, 
just real quickly, we have a sign sweep. So this is just like you saw before, but didn't hear before, you know, the um, typical kind of sign chirp. It's actually a step sign, but the transitions are so smooth from frequency to frequency, the phase continues, it sounds like a chirp. The next thing is now we captured the response that we recorded. Um, in this case, a speaker with some really obvious loose particles. It's a solder bead inside the voice coil. We, pick, we picked a particularly bad one, so it would be easy to hear, but this is kind of a severe case. It is a severe case. Hopefully you can faintly hear the rattling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. But now when we extract the, uh, we remove the stimulus from, this is exactly the same recording without the stimulus, the stimulus notched out. Now we can not only see, but we can also hear the loose particles. Very clearly. And I think at the beginning, you probably heard the stimulus a little. Yeah, just a little. Some second and third harmonic at low frequency. So that is the missing fundamental. So now we got to figure out how are we going to put limits on this? Well, we really need to come up with a um, way to measure the level. And we want to measure it ideally in DBSPL. So we do the uh, RMS and we get the envelope. But as you can see, that the um, peaks do vary versus uh, frequency, which is versus time, time and frequency in this case. So how can we come up with an easier way to set limits? Because you notice some of these peaks, things kind of bounce around and you don't want to count that twice. You don't want to count that twice. So what we do is we use um, what's called prominence. And I'll explain that here now. And so instead of, um, it really comes from cartography um, where you're looking at a mountain range and mm -hmm. typically we think of elevation, you know, it's like, okay, um, you know, how far above sea level is this peak? But if you're hiking a mountain, what really matters is what is the difference between where you're starting and where you're ending? <laughs> And that could be called the prominence. So in this um, elevation, elevation C obviously is the highest. But if what we really want to know is the difference between the nearest uh, peak and the nearest, nearest null or lull, we would say, what's the prominence? And in this case, it's actually prominence A, which is going to be the biggest difference. So that is going to help us be able to detect when there is a spike that is audible. And I'll, I'll show you some examples in a moment. So here is now the envelope analysis, but prominence is applied to it. So now it cleans up the envelope quite a bit where it's very obvious that we have some sharp spikes due to these transient events. You can see there's some little ones in the background, but we've effectively increased our dynamic range and made it easy to set limits with a straight line again. And what we do is we just count the number of times the events go above the threshold. This is just a snippet of the total sweep. But if we looked at the entire sweep, we would actually see 110 uh, of these spikes that you heard during the sign sweep. And again, if it was background noise, it'd probably just be a few. So just to kind of um, repeat, we got the response waveform, the recorded response waveform. We notch out the fundamental. We get what we call the loose particle waveform, which we can play back and listen to and correlate. And it's not just going to be um, loose particles, but you can also hear distortion, which is pretty entertaining as well if you listen to rub and buzz this way. Then we take the envelope, and then we take the prominence. And if I just let this thing cycle, you can see very clearly with your eye how the spikes show up and get filtered, essentially. And we end up with the prominence. So.
So then the solution for that is the factory worker notices that and takes a little air gun and blows out the speaker and tries again. <laughs> if they can. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, more often than not, it goes Maybe, in the... Like uh, people, I mean, most, most people we're talking to today have never been to the factory, but yeah, they're always got the air guns blowing off the speakers before they test them. So that's kind of a standard uh, operating procedure. Yeah, and you're right. And you know, I always tell customers... Measure the speaker pointing down. <laughs> um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is you're not going to get stuff falling on top of the speaker like you might in a chamber. Number two, if there is a loose particle, it's more likely to bounce around off the um, the diaphragm or the uh, dust cap. So um, if you point the speaker up, the loose particle might just get stuck in the bottom and you won't catch it. And then you ship it and then it bounces around. And your customer says, hey, I can hear some something rattling around. Mm. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, I I even do uh, demos of this with uh, salt and pepper. I just put on top of the loudspeaker and I got to blow it off at the end to kind of, you know, get rid of them. Right. All right. So last quick sales pitch here and then we can move on to your questions. Um, but basically, yeah, we're we're trying to refine things, and I'm a big believer in uh, you know product improvement for through refinement, and so we're constantly trying to make it easier, um, improve our algorithms, make uh, setting limits easier, be able to listen to what we're measuring and correlate objective with subjective. And uh, yeah, and if it can catch other problems on your product, you know, not just the uh, the transducer. I know the automotive loudspeaker guys; they they hate it when um, one of their speakers gets mounted improperly in a hundred thousand dollar car, mm -hmm. and then the car manufacturer blames the uh, the loudspeaker manufacturer. And it's like it's not our problem; <laughs> it's it's you did a bad job of fastening that loudspeaker in the, in whatever the door panel. So it's yeah. also good. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, we've got a, we've got a few minutes left. So, uh, what, uh, what's the future holding for listen? Well, good question. Um, you know, it's really a bunch of different things that I'm trying to, uh, work on as usual, probably too many things. Um, but I mean, I think everyone is, uh, aware of, you know, not just smart, um, speakers, but also, um, things like spatial audio. Um, I personally have always been curious about, you know, how do we determine a uh, source localization? How do we hear it? And, you know, there's anyone who is, um, been doing this is really aware that there's there's a lot going on um and it's not just you know headphones but it's also cars um and it's really thanks to um you know companies that are trying to work with like AES and Alti mm -hmm. um and create uh the source material we're actually trying to figure out ways to uh to measure <laughs> the source uh, location. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your your thoughts, like so, measuring these new things, like people talk about measuring spatial audio or immersive or whatever this <laughs> this new buzzword is, and I'm sure this yeah, is, this is a continuing progress, and this is how they come up with new products and new market segments. So we got to live with it. But uh, it, I guess, uh, what are your thoughts on the on that spatial audio? Yeah, so I, I you know, I really had a, uh, I guess you could say an eye opener and an ear opener when uh, about two years ago at Christmas, we bought our son um, a VR headset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought it was just for gaming and I was not all that excited about it. But um you know, I put on the VR headset and he had me take the um, roller coaster ride with the VR headset on. 
And I was just absolutely blown away that um, both by the video and the audio and that without actually um, feeling any of the vibration or the, or the motion, my brain was telling me I was going up and down and getting slightly, uh, you know, seasick or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, this, this really is pretty amazing. And I wanted to figure out a way to, uh, to correlate, um, you know, the, the spatial audio to ways to measure it. I mean, I think one of the things that really um, convinced me that this was the future was uh, just starting to play around with binaural recordings and listening to, um, ideally, you know, my own HRTF, which is, is a, it's of course, extremely difficult to get your, your own personal HT, HRTF measure because it takes a long time. But there's been a lot of advances there. I mean, Dolby Atmos is everywhere now. Yeah. And um, we have customers that basically want to know how good a job they're doing at reproducing um, the source material, the sound objects. And, you know, can we come up with a way to say, if I encode a source, you know, I don't know, a violin, a musical instrument, at a particular distance, a particular angle, azimuth, and then I play it back on my quote surround sound system or my 7.2.1, whatever mm -hmm. channel system, is it really doing an accurate job of reproducing the spatial audio um, location? And I, I talk to these customers and I say, so how are you measuring this? And they're like, we, we're not, we're, we're just subjectively listening to it. Um, some of them are use a laser pointer and closing their eyes. So there's there's a big demand, I feel, to how can we come up with a metric to accurately determine if the sound reproduction of the spatial audio is indeed what the uh, the musician or the recording artist or the mixer intended. So um, you know, it's early days for us in that we are pretty familiar with uh, interall cross correlation and interall level difference kind of measurements, and they're they're very good at helping uh, determine um, a good job of localization as well as development. But they're still not really there to say, "Hey, that's where this source is. That's where the source is," and and take into account the uh, the room effects as well as is really a big challenge. So. I'm hoping to uh, work on that. And I had a good taste of this when I went to the AS Spatial Audio Conference in England, mm -hmm. uh, which was sold out like immediately. It's like the interest in this is huge, not just from the people creating it, but also from the people trying to uh, reproduce it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So that's uh, quite a bit of uh, information for today, but uh maybe just a kind of a fun fact to kind of finish things off. So what's maybe you want to share with us, like what's the most interesting thing that you've had to test? Um, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I mean, uh, I, I've been very fortunate that I've met a lot of different types of customers with a lot of different types of applications and people trying to measure some of the strangest things. I mean, it's the usual stuff, right? Headphones, smart devices, phones, watches, sound bars. But, you know, some of the more interesting ones were um, during the pandemic uh, measuring um, mask. Um, mm. I mean, we all experienced the muffled sound of people talking through uh, N95 mask and things like that. And um, I don't know if you guys ever saw the Dyson uh, headphones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't like, even know where that's made. <laughs> People started putting microphones outside the mask and then piping it into the headphones because, frankly, the uh, it was very hard to hear speech intelligibility through a mask. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorites, though, was uh, we actually had a uh, potato chip manufacturer who wanted to test, or, or company who wanted to test the crunch factor oh, of geez. the potato chips. <laughs> 
I and think, you know, they I think I've seen obviously you, stale yeah. potato chips are not don't crunch very well. Right. So speaker crest factor and uh, transients that we actually were able to use some of the same techniques that we use for capturing transient uh, distortion. Wow. And uh, I guess last but not least, um, I am a bit of a gearhead and I, I love cars. And, uh, you know, I, I will admit I, uh, I own a Tesla and one of my complaints, <laughs> my first Tesla was, you know, it was super quiet when you're going around town, but on the, on the highway, it was a lot of wind noise, even though um, the car is incredibly, quote, um, you know, low drag coefficient, but there was a lot of wind noise. So when um, my lease was up and I got the new Tesla, it was supposed to be quieter, and I wanted to see if I could measure it. I also wanted, frankly, to test out our new um, audio interface that was portable and can be powered off of uh, a USB um input so it didn't need to be plugged in so i went out and did some road tests before i got the the new tesla and then afterwards and the new one supposedly had active noise reduction which also is kind of a big thing right now in the automotive industry and i wanted to see how good it was and frankly it wasn't great um so <laughs> we'll be uh doing a um uh, youtube video on that hopefully soon i mean there were some other things that we measured which was pretty entertaining like uh how the uh how loud this max spl in the car and you know in the tesla it goes up to 11 like in spinal tap and some of those funny things but uh yeah you're welcome to check some of that out some of the those measurements are already in videos are already on our youtube channel okay yeah we'll we'll put those links in our description for this one so that's the nice stuff. Uh, Simon, do you have any questions before we... Uh, nothing. I'll spend all my questions, mate. All right. Okay. So that's that's great. Encourage everybody to like, subscribe, share, and hit that bell notification for future videos. Um, Steve, thanks so much for your time today. This is extremely informative um, and, uh, and well planned out. We love the effort you put into the presentation today. So thank you so much. Are you welcome. Steve. Okay. Thanks for having me, and, and then thanks for your patience. No problem. All right. So uh, <laughs> see you next and time, attention. everybody. Okay. Bye Take bye. care.